Bibles to the book of Hebrews, and we are in chapter number 9, uh, one final time, and we're just going to the end of the chapter. Um, the verse that I didn't really spend any time on last week was verse 27, and it's such an important verse in the Bible that I felt that it would be important for us to uh, look at it tonight. So we'll read verse 27 uh, and verse 28 together. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So when you think about this verse, and we really will be considering verse 27 uh, tonight as our main uh, thought, um, when you consider all that we've looked at so far in the book of Hebrews, we've seen that Christ is a fulfillment of all the Old Testament sacrifices. We've seen that he's better. He's better than the angels. He's better than the prophets. He's better than the sacrifices. He's better, he has a better priesthood. He's, so he's better than Aaron. Um, so he's better in every respect. And we also have seen in this chapter quite a few times as to how all the, all the things that were in the a tabernacle in the earthly sanctuary were just a type or a picture of the true which was in heaven. So it's really arresting our attention to things that are of eternal consequence and to recognize that all the things that we have and had on the earth and particularly the Jews um, at that time were all shadows and pictures or a type of the true. Uh, we we uh, looked at last week as to the three appearings of Christ, how that he, he has appeared uh, to take away sin. He is now presently appearing in the presence for God, uh, in the presence of God for us. And then we also saw as to how one day he's going to be appearing. And we also alluded to that in verse 28. He's going to one day come again without sin and receive us uh, unto himself. So in light of all of these things that are eternal, it's important to recognize that our lives you know, at best are brief, uh, and we need to think and uh, plan our lives and live our lives with eternity in view. And so this is what verse 27 is talking about. Uh, it's appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So this is of a, an enormous consequence. So two main thoughts uh, that we want to look at. We're first going to look at the appointment, and then we're going to look at the judgment. The judgment we'll look at in two in two parts tonight as well. But let's uh, firstly just consider about this appointment in verse 27. It's appointment. It is appointed unto men once to die. You know, for many people, this is a most dreaded appointment to keep. This is something that people put off or they try not to think about or they somehow hope it's never going to happen to them. But it really it is something that comes to, to all of us. And even in this past week, I'm sure that if you, if you like uh, motorsport, you'll have seen that, uh, and even if you didn't, you would have seen it on the news, that uh, Nicky Lauda, who was the three-time uh, Formula One world champion, he had died. Now, obviously, he had lived quite a, quite a successful life, humanly speaking, but not without his tragedy. And so when he had that terrible crash at the Nürburgring, uh, people didn't think, that he was going to make it. I didn't know that he was a Catholic, but evidently they'd read to him his last rites, so they must have thought he was, he was actually going to die. Uh, but he did survive, and miraculously so, and was able to, you know, continue racing that season. And then we also know that uh, years after that, that he had uh, two kidney transplants. And then we know that last year that he had a, a, a double lung transplant. Because, and I think that was because of the damage they experienced with the Nürburgring. But it was amazing that um, if ever you, you had watched uh, any of the stuff on Formula One, that, that people were always saying things like, it's not going to be long before he's back. We're going to see him walking down the pit lane, and you're kind of expecting that he's going he's to pull through. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, is that he had an appointment that he had to keep. Now, he had said a, a number of various quotations. You know, people quote him a lot of the time, but this is one of the quotations that he made. He said, you appreciate that it's very easy to die and you have to arrange your life to cope with that reality. 
And of course, that's quite true. It's very easy to die, particularly when you're in such a dangerous sport. But I do hope in terms of, of, of him that he had made the arrangements to die. Because the fact of the matter is, once a person has died, there's no more arrangements that can, that can be made. As uh, I think it's in the book of Ecclesiastes, where it says, as a tree falls, so shall it lie. You know, so when a person, how a person dies, uh, that's essentially how they're going to spend eternity. So our text says that it's appointed unto men once to die. Uh, but we fear this for some reason. You know, we, we try and camouflage it. We go to the graveyards, we, we, uh, we bury a loved one, and we don't even like to see the dirt. We have artificial grass surrounding the mounds. We have flowers, just everything and anything to take our minds away from this truth that it is appointed unto men once to die. And for all of man's attempts to try and camouflage death, or to make it seem a bit more palatable, it is something that is going to come to all. And of course, we know that the matter of death comes to us all quite simply because of uh, man's sin in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 3, you don't need to turn there, but Genesis 3 verse 19, uh, God had said to Adam that in the sweat of his face, he would eat bread till he return unto the ground. For out of it thou was taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And Romans 5 says, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And then we also read in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and verse 6 and 7, it says, Or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, then shall the dust return to the earth, earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So death is something that happens to every one of us. It's an appointment that we all have to keep. Now sometimes, maybe you've heard this where people say you need to be careful because there may be a bullet, this is maybe for the men, with your name on it. And uh, you don't want that bullet to hit you if it's got your name on it. But they say a grenade that's got written on it to whom it may concern. So it doesn't matter who you are, death is going to come to you one way or another. And this is what the Bible says. Death is no respecter of persons. Uh, graveyards are full of people that are wise and foolish. People that are wealthy and people that are paupers. People that are religious and people that are atheists. Death is something that is no respecter of persons in any way at all. And so when we think about the appointment that we have with death, we, we are reminded of the, the fact that the Bible says that life is at best brief. James said this in chapter 4. He says, whereas you know not what your life shall be uh, or on the morrow, for what is your life? It's like a vapor. So you think about a vapor that comes up from the kettle when you boil it and you think you can grab it, uh, but just as you grab it, it's disappeared. And, and in light of eternity, that's just what our life is like. It's just a, a short Period of time, just like a vapor, appears for a little while and then it vanishes away. Job said, My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. They are. Moses said this in the book of Psalms. We don't often think of Moses being writing any of the Psalms, but Psalms 90 is one of what he wrote. And he said, The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years or eighty years, Yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thy anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. So the aspect of this appointment that the writer to the Hebrews says in, in chapter 9, verse 27, this appointment of death is something that applies to every single one of us. It doesn't matter who we are. We, are going to, we have to come face to face with this reality that one day we are going to die. There are exceptions. In the Old Testament, there are just two exceptions. And that, of course, is uh, Enoch in the book of Genesis, and then later on of Elijah. Those are two exceptions of people that left this world and did not die. And they actually like a picture, if you like, of the rapture of the church. So if Christ was to come 
that now we would be able to be ushered into heaven without having to pass through the portal of death. But other than that, we all have this appointment with death. And for those that fear death, it is not the end. It's really just the beginning. Because sometimes people think of, of death as just like a cessation of being. But really, it is just a, it's just the beginning. We need to think of death more of a separation of our soul and spirit from our bodies. That's what death speaks about. It is a, it is a separation. And so the appointment that we have with death, it gives way to the second part of that verse, which is the judgment. So it's appointed unto men once to die, and then after this we read in verse 27, the judgment. So there's no reincarnation, there's no second chance, there's no purgatory, there's no glimmer of hope. A person dies, and then the Bible says that their next appointment that they're going to have is that of judgment. And it's important that we have an understanding as to what the Bible says concerning judgment. It is a theme in the Word of God. And in fact, when you read the Bible, you will come across a number of different types of judgments in the Bible. We're just going to focus our attention on two of those uh, judgments. It has to do with both a person who is saved and a person that is unsaved. Because that's essentially what this verse has to do with. And as we think about these two judgments, we don't want to misunderstand them in any way. So some of you may have may be aware of this. I'm not really sure, but I think it's good for us to be mindful of the fact that after death, this appointment with death, we have this next appointment, and that is that of judgment. So the Bible speaks of two main judgments. And they have to do with a person that is saved, and they have to do with a person that is lost. Some people have this idea that there's going to be one general judgment, that everyone that's ever was born is going to be ushered into the presence of God and, and there's going to be this judgment. But that's not how the Bible speaks of judgment. So there are two main judgments. There's a judgment that's going to be for people that are unsaved or unbelievers, and there's a judgment that is for uh, people that are saved. So we'll look at these two uh, judgments tonight. The, the first one that we would consider is a judgment that has to do with those that are unsaved. And the Bible speaks of this judgment as being the great white throne judgment. So this is a judgment where a person is ushered into the presence of God. And as we'll see, this judgment doesn't determine whether that person is going to be saved or whether they're going to be lost. That was determined actually when they died. Because, in fact, if a person dies without Jesus Christ, you know, they're not just going to be condemned. Jesus said they're condemned already. So the, the, their fate is sealed. So what's happened is a person has breathed their loss, they've stepped out into eternity, if you like, and they've gone to a place, if they do not know Jesus Christ as their saviour, they've gone to a place called hell. And the Bible speaks of hell as being like a holding place. And they are there, because we sometimes think of, of hell as being an eternity, but really it's the lake of fire that is the eternity. Hell is just but a holding place. And there's going to come a time where uh, after um, God's plan for the ages has run through, that all of those people that are in hell are going to be delivered up to God, and there they're going to be judged. So look, if you would, in the book of Revelation and chapter 20. And we're going to read together from verse 5. Revelation chapter 20, reading from verse 5. We'll just read uh, verse 6 and then we'll skip over a few verses. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection... On such a second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. If you were looking for a time frame as to when a person, uh, if a person was to die tonight, and how long they would be in hell, we could say it would be a minimum of about a thousand years. 
we would, if we were to be more, ex you couldn't be more exact, but you could say a, m a minimum of a thousand and seven years, because we know there'd have to be a, a tribulation period as well, but we don't know as to when that will be. So we would say it would be at least a thousand years that a person would be in this awful place called hell. And we say a thousand years because of what the, the Bible tells us in verse number six. If we go down to verse 11, we are not going to spend any time looking at Satan and being bound for that thousand year period. But verse 11 says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, as we read these verses, the first thing that we need to address is that this is a judgment that does not have to do with the person that is saved. Because sometimes people read the book of Revelation and they're filled with a sense of dread and fear. But this, this particular judgment, you will, you will not find one saved person here. This has to do with those that are unsaved. The only people that are present here are those that have gone through life and died and have never trusted Christ to save them. And you can imagine that as the Apostle John is writing these words down, and God has shown him some tremendous things that are going to happen during the tribulation period upon the earth. And then he's, he's confronted with the scene of this great white throne. And he's, he's confronted not only with the scene of the one that sits upon the throne, but of all the dead that have been ushered into his presence. And what an awful sight it must be to, to see these people who are already condemned and their judgment is going to be one that is going to pronounce their, uh, if you like, the um, scope of their punishment. So these verses speak about a terrible judgment day where all of the lost of the world will stand before God and face him in judgment. There's nowhere to hide. There's no excuses to give. There's no one to blame. That a lost sinner will stand before God. And God will give judgment. Now it's called the great white throne. Great because of its power. This we could say is the highest court in the universe. There is no other court that you could, a person could appeal to and say well I don't like this judgment. This is God's throne. And so there is no other, no higher throne than that. And it's not only called great, but it's called white. And the white speaks about its purity. So if you think of courts that operate here and now, oftentimes courts are tainted with sin. And there could be bias, or they may not have all of the facts, or the judge may be, you know, corrupted and bribed one way or another. But the, this particular courtroom, this particular judgment, it speaks of it as being white, as pure, because we know that God's judgment will be absolutely fair uh, and righteous. The judge who sits at this bench is absolutely infallible. So it's a great throne because it speaks of its power. It's a white throne because it speaks of its purity. And then I'd also like you to consider, if you would, the judge who is going to sit upon this throne. Now, in our reading here, in Revelation, the judge isn't described for us. But the Bible actually is very careful to tell us in other places just who that judge is. And oftentimes people have this thought that it is, it is God the Father who is going to be sitting and presiding on this throne and handing out judgment. Actually, it is God the Son who is going to be judging at this throne. Let me just share with you a few verses that tell us this. In John chapter 5 and verse 22, the Bible says, The Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because 
He is the Son of Man. So that tells us that God, the Father, has given the responsibility of judgment to God the Son. He's the one that's going to execute that judgment. And in Acts chapter 10, we have a similar thing uh, telling us there, because in uh, this is, you know, going back as to, uh, in Acts chapter 10, it's talking about how Christ had died upon the cross and how that he was resurrected the third day. And verse 40 says, Him God hath raised up the third day, showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Notice verse 42, it says, And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he, in other words, Jesus, it is he that was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead, or the alive and the dead. So, again, that is emphasizing the fact that Jesus is the one who is the judge. And then another verse is in Acts chapter 17. This is after Paul had uh, gone to um, the Areopagus in Greece, and he had spoken to all of those people on, on Mars Hill, and he told them about this unknown God whom they ignorantly worshipped. And verse 31 of Acts chapter 17 says that he had appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. So Jesus is the one that is going to be sitting upon that throne. Paul said the same thing in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He said, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So here is the one, the one who is Lord of Lords, the one who is King of Kings, the one whom the Bible says that in him and at his name, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And all of the ungodly, wicked dead are going to be gathered together from uh, the beginning of time until the end of time. They're going to be gathered together and uh, into one place, all that have lived and died without God, and they're going to bend the knee. The one whom they cursed, the one whom they blasphemed, that's the one who's going to preside on this throne, and he is going to give a judgment. And then, just going back to the book of Revelation again, we see in verse 12 uh, the judgment of the judge. The Bible says, I saw the dead, small and great. So in other words, people that were, you know, just the ordinary, uh, you know, man in the street and those that were the, you know, the great leaders, the small and the great stand before God. And in verse 13, we read, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell gave up the dead which were in them. So people from every walk of life and people are gathered together who, who have always who have, who have lived at one time or another, and they are brought before God, and every lost person is going to stand, or kneel rather, before the presence of our Saviour, and await His judgment. And verse 13 tells us, and this helps us to understand something about this judgment, because it says, and they were judged, every man according to his works. So this is, the thing that we don't understand about it, and the thing I don't understand, is the, how that there will be a punishment according to their works. We, we know that their eternal doom is sure. So it isn't going to be a matter of somebody has a shorter period of time in the lake of fire. There's an eternity in the lake of fire for everyone. But whether there's a a hotter place, whether there's a place closer to the devil, I don't know. We do read in the Old Testament, I think it's Ezekiel, where it says that they're going to look upon, the, upon Satan, who's, who eventually is going to end up in the lake of fire, and they're going to look narrowly upon him and say, are you the one that did deceive us and cause nations to tremble? So they'll actually see and understand who Satan is. So whether they're closer to him, I, I do not know. But we do know this, is that they are judged according to, to their works. 
the God who's keeping a, a record of everything that a person does. We might think to ourselves, well, it doesn't matter. Just eat, drink, and be merry, and tomorrow you die because you don't know Christ the Savior. Well, evidently it does. And God is a just judge. And those unsaved people that will be ushered before his presence will be judged righteously according to their works. So the sweet uh, lady who lives down the street, who is a Christ rejecter, uh, is still going to go to this judgment and still be cast into the lake of fire but someone like Stalin or, or, or Hitler or someone like that you can imagine that their judgment would be far far worse God will do the right thing but it doesn't end there we also do read that the books were opened and uh, you won't believe this I've got some blood in my Bible the bloodstained book Mm -hmm. um, we, we read in verse 12 that the books were opened the, judge, the dead were judged out of those things which were, which were written in them so it speaks about this record that's been uh, kept and uh, in Luke chapter 8 we are reminded that nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest neither anything hid that shall not be known or come abroad and so all that a person has done is going to be recorded in this book but then there's another book and the Bible tells us in verse 13 that there was this other book or another book that was opened and it tells us what this book is it's called the book of life and this book is similar to like in, in ancient cities where a, a city would have like a registry of all the people that live in that city well here is the book of life and God being a righteous judge, not only will he judge them according to their works for all their wicked deeds, the book of life is going to be opened. And will go down, 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 and there'll be an awful blank space where that person's name could have been or should have been. So because of their failure to turn from sin and turn in faith to God and be born again, the Bible says that whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So the eternal destiny of those that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be in the lake of fire. And we see that they're going to be judged according to their works. It's appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. So the wicked dead stand before God. But I think it's also important for you and I as believers tonight to be able to recognize that there is a judgment uh, that we face as well. Now I have to uh, say this and um, begin this judgment with this very clear statement that this judgment does not have to do with our eternal destination. This judgment does not have to do with our sin. In any way because our eternal de destination was uh, uh, determined when we placed our faith and trust in Jesus that you know whosoever uh, would believe on him and trust on him <coughs> would have e eternal life <coughs> and we also know that our sins aren't going to be brought into question because all of the sins that you and I have ever committed were placed upon the Lord Jesus Christ and he paid the penalty for our sins so what would be the purpose of this particular judgment well this judgment is known as the judgment seat of christ it's only for believers another name that is given is the beamer seat now some people say i like it because i drive a bmw they're called the beamer seat i think alec was very sharp in saying that but a beamer seat essentially means like a raised platform or, or, a, or a, la a raised place where people would stand upon and they would make announcements or they would give commendations in a town or judgments would be given uh, as well. So the, the word beamer seat speaks about a raised uh, platform, but it has reference particularly to the judgment seat of Christ. So the, the verse for that is 2 Corinthians 5.10. And the Bible says that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, whether according to that he hath done, 
whether it be good or bad. And then another verse is 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 13. And there the Bible says that every man's work shall be made manifest or will be open, you know, all can see it. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So when you think about this particular judgment, we know that it doesn't have to do with our sin because our sins were judged at Calvary. We know that it doesn't determine if we're saved or lost because this is a judgment that only, that only is for those that are saved. So what does it do? It's a judgment by way of evaluating our life and our service for the Lord. It doesn't determine who's lost or saved. It de determines what rewards you may receive as a believer. So, so oftentimes we think like this, that you know, the, the quantity of our work is important. But really, God is interested in the quality of our work. And when you read in 1 Corinthians 13, and we don't have the time to read it through tonight, but when you read through those verses, you'll see that some people... You know, build their life with, with hay and wood and stubble. And you can have a, a, you know, a huge structure made out of that. But when it comes to the fiery test of God's judgment, where Christ's eyes pierce upon those, they just burnt up in an instant. But that which will stand the test is going to be the, the gold and the silver and the precious stones. So in, in our text here where it says, uh, in 2 Corinthians 5.10, where it says that everyone's going to receive what is done, whether it be good or bad, the bad doesn't have reference to that which is uh, wicked. It really has that reference to that which is worthless. So our sins aren't going to be judged, but our service will be judged. Why you do, because God knows the motives behind everything that we do, why you do what you do, that's going to be judged. And how you do, what you do, that's going to be judged. And so God is able to have a correct review of everything that we've done. And of course, if we're not doing anything, that, that's going to be judged as well. So God is in the business of building, and he wants to use us in his work to build something that's going to stand the test of time. So the fire that Paul speaks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is going to show that which is permanent and that which was perishable. The fire is going to consume the wood and the hay and the stubble and uh, the gold and the silver and the precious stones will stand the test of time. So I take you to once again the book of one, uh, to the book of Revelation and look, chapter 1 and we see something about the eyes. And we'll, let's just look at the appearance of our Saviour here. Yeah. Revelation chapter 1, and we'll see some things about him in verse 10 down to verse 15. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, in Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about perhaps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as, it, as if they burned in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Now this is a, a, a description of our Saviour, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you know, you have sometimes when people say, oh, I, I dreamt something about Jesus, or some people will say, I had this death experience. And again, it's totally foreign to the Bible. It's appointed unto men once to die. Some people say, no, I died. I went to heaven. I saw Jesus. He gave me a new message. 
you know, normally something like tell everybody that you love them or something like that, and then came back to earth with this new mission. That's totally foreign to the Bible because it's appointed unto men once to die. But how did you see Jesus? What did it look like? Oh, well, he had piercing blue eyes, they'll tell you, and long flowing blonde hair, and there he was in sandals. That's not how the Bible describes him. Hair white like wool, the Bible says. Eyes like a flame of fire, and feet uh, like fine brass at burning, and his voice, the sound of many waters. So the description that these people give is nothing like the description that the Bible tells us of Christ. But what we do see in this text here is that the eyes of our Lord and our Saviour are going to be able to see through everything that we've done. There's nothing that we could hide from Him. There's, he's going to see it for what it is. And so He's going to review our work. That which is worthless is going to be burnt up. That which will stand the fiery test will then, of course, be rewarded. That brings me to the second thing about this judgment. We have the review, and then we have the reward. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 14, the Bible says, If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So that tells us that your faithful service for God is going to be rewarded when you get to heaven. Those things that are going to stand the test of time. Now, the Bible speaks about different types of rewards that you could have. In fact, the Bible speaks of five different crowns that you're able to receive. And so those are, those are things that you know, we can work for and, and labor for, and those are tremendous things to consider. I, I think it will be wonderful that when we, when we die and we ushered into the presence of our Savior, and of course it will just be like that, that we hear those words... Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of our Lord. That, that, that will be fantastic to hear. But then there's going to be coming this day where there's this beamer seat judgment. And I believe that this will take place in heaven while the world is going through a time of great tribulation period. And so we'll be in heaven enjoying the pleasures of God's right hand. We'll have enjoyed the marriage supper of the Lamb. We'll also have this time of, of judgment or review, if you like, of our works and of our labours. And in verse 15, as I said earlier, of 1 Corinthians 3, he says, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So if our work has no <coughs> quality, no substance, we did it for the wrong motive, we did it for ourselves, we did it in the wrong way, those things are going to be burnt up. But, but, but God says, but they'll be saved. Or a person that has never labored for the Lord, never done anything for Jesus. Not, not one soul they told about Jesus, not one good work they did for him, nothing that would last. Well, they'll be saved. But again, verse 15 says, but so as by fire. So in our kind of modern vernacular, we might say, you know, saved by the skin of your teeth, just made it into heaven. And on one hand, you and I say, well, it doesn't matter. As long as we get to heaven, that's the main thing, isn't it? That, of course, is, is reward enough just to go to that wonderful home and to be with the Lord whom we love. That's, of course, worthy of, uh, of, you know, of what we desire. But, you know, it shouldn't be that we should go through life's journey and, and uh, go through our life and not think, well, I'm going to try and do something for my Savior, the one who loved me, the one who gave himself for me. Because, you know, there's going to come a time where we receive our crowns for what we've done. But we, we can recognize that we aren't worthy to wear these crowns. And we'll take these crowns and we'll cast them at our Savior's feet because He alone is worthy. And, and won't it be a sad day? Now, of course, we can't think of sadness and tears in heaven because it wouldn't be heaven. But you must understand there must be some sort of a regret if someone's works, everything they've done has just been burnt up. But wouldn't it be just for our, our language for now, for how it is now, wouldn't it be sad? Wouldn't there be a disappointment if you had no crown that you could throw at his feet? No, no work that you could lay down at his feet and say, Lord, this is what I've did, done for you. I, I was faithful and I, and I did the best I could 
with what I had and I allowed you to work through me and in me and this is what I've done. And you hear that well done, thou good and faithful servant. That, that's a tremendous thing. And so it shouldn't, it shouldn't be sufficient for us to say, well, uh, just as long as I get to heaven, that's, that's all that matters. And I think there should be a work that should go behind us. You know, we know those verses quite well, don't we? Because we know that we're saved by grace. So we, our works don't save us, can't add to our salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, that is the gift of God, not of works. Not of works. So we're not going to get to heaven and boast about why we're there. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Can you imagine if you could do something to cause you to be saved? When you get to heaven, people wouldn't stop bragging about it. I'm here because I did this. But when we all get to heaven, we'll all be saying, I'm here because Jesus went to the cross for me. He died for me. He saved my soul. He's the only reason why I'm here. So we know that we're saved by grace, not of works. There's no room for boasting. But we often fail to read past those verses. Because verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 2 says that we are His workmanship, created in, uh, I'm going to miss, uh, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So God has saved us. And uh, we're eternally saved. We're kept by His power, but He saved us for a purpose. And so our lives today should count for Him as we seek to do something for His glory. So this judgment has to do with believers only. It has to be with those that have trusted Christ as Savior, been born again, their works will be reviewed, and that which has remained will be rewarded. And actually, when I think about the reward, to me it's, it's an amazing thing, because I know that anything that we do as a believer tonight, any service that we do, we can't do it in our own strength. We'll fail, and we fail miserably. So what God does, He empowers us, He enables us, He gives us the Holy Spirit to live, to enable us to live like we should, to work like we should. So in other words, He gives us the wherewithal so that we can do this work. And then when we get to heaven, He rewards us for what He enabled us to do in the first place. Isn't that wonderful? God is a God who just delights to bless us. And and so we know that we're going to be rewarded for faithful service. So we read in verse 27, it says, It's appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. In chapter 12, in verse 28, the Bible says of Hebrews, Wherefore we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace that we might serve God with reverence and with godly fear. So may the Lord encourage us tonight. If you know Christ as your Saviour, rejoice in that. And rejoice in the fact that you're able to labour and work for Him today, knowing that there's going to come a time where your faithful service will be rewarded. And may one of the things that would uh, drive us along on life's journey is to warn those of the fact that not only do they have an appointment with death, but after that there's the judgment. May we be careful to share with them the gospel so that they can come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, the Saviour. So may the Lord encourage us as we think about these things tonight. Let us pray. Father, we thank you once again for what we see in the Word of God. And we thank you, Lord, for this very important truth. And we pray, Lord, that we would live our lives with eternity uh, in mind. Uh, Lord, we are reminded as to what the Apostle Paul said, where he he said, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. The things which are seen are temporal, but that which is unseen is eternal. And so, Lord, help us, we pray, to live our lives with eternity in view. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.